welcome to Depe TV, a venue where we can be in one place virtually, even from different locations in reality. This is Teacher Rev, your grade 11 math teacher, your guide to an exciting and amazing math venture. Have you ever experienced conducting a survey for a classwork that you did on other subjects? I guess this is something not new to you, right? In research, Collecting data can either be done in the entire population or the subset of this population. Can you still recall what we call that subset? If your answer is sample, your answer is correct. If a researcher opts to use sample rather than a population, what do you think must be taken into consideration? Exactly. The researcher must take into consideration the number of elements in the sample and how these elements can be chosen out of his target population. So, when the researcher considers a school as the target of his study and the school has 1,850 students, what is the population? If your answer is 1,850 students, your answer is correct. If you are the researcher, and you would like to do an interview. Will you consider the whole population of the school? If your answer is no, that's good. It means you have an idea of the process that we do in conducting research. Today, be ready to capture the radiance in the complete picture of random sampling and sampling distribution of statistics. Let's start by talking about population. Population includes all of its elements from a set of data, and the size of the population is the number of observations in the population. Sample consists of one or more data drawn from the population. It is a subset or an incomplete set taken from a population of objects or observations. Why do you think we need to get a sample? If your answer is that taking samples instead of the population saves time and cost-effective, then you hit it. Although, we need to be careful in the process of sampling because it has its advantages, but it can also be a source of bias and inaccuracy in your study. So what process do we need to take so that our sampling process will give equal chance for every individual in the population to be included? This is something familiar with you for you discussed this when you were in grade 7. If your answer is random sampling, that is correct. Random sampling is a sampling method of choosing representatives from the population wherein every sample has an equal chance of being selected. Accurate data can be collected using random sampling techniques. Let's consider the situation below. As of May 6, 2020, the Department of Health recorded 131,786 unique individuals who got tested for the COVID-19 out of approximately 109,369,019 Filipinos. What is the population in the given situation, and how many elements are there in the population? If your answer is that the approximate number of Filipinos is the population, and there are 109,369,019 elements in the population, then your answer is correct. Which is the sample? If you answered the tested individuals is the sample and there are 131,786 elements in the sample, then your answer is correct. Did the situation illustrate random sampling? Why or why not? If your answer is no, it did not illustrate random sampling, then it's correct because not all Filipinos have equal chance of being selected. Maybe all those who are asymptomatic are chosen. Okay, let's look at another situation. Barangay Pagkakaisa has 400 family beneficiaries of the government's Social Amelioration Program or SAP. The barangay captain decides to survey how these recipients spend their money during community quarantine. 
Copley writes each of the names of the beneficiaries in small pieces of paper. He rolls and put them in a box, then draws 50 names to answer the survey questionnaire. What is the population in a given situation and how many elements are there in the population? If your answer is the family beneficiaries of the government social amelioration program is the population and there are 400 families as elements in the population, then your answer is correct. Did the situation illustrate random sampling? Why or why not? If your answer is yes, it illustrates random sampling, then it's correct. Because there is a randomization wherein every family who received SAP have equal chance of being selected from the box. At this point, you already knew that random sampling is a method of selecting a sample from a population such a way that every member of the population is equally likely to be chosen as part of the sample. This time, let's look at the different ways to randomly select our sample by looking at the following situations. Let's start with our first situation. A researcher writes the name of each student on a piece of paper, mixes the papers in a bowl, and draws seven pieces of paper. Do you think the situation illustrates random sampling? If your answer is yes, it represents a random sampling, you are correct. The given situation illustrates what we call a simple random sampling. The pieces of paper correspond to each student as elements of the population. All of them have an equal chance of being selected as a sample by randomly picking seven pieces of paper in a bowl. So the first type of random sampling is the simple random sampling. They are usually represented by a unique identification number that is written on equal sized and shaped papers and then selection of sample is possible through the lottery method. Random numbers selected to decide which elements are included as the sample. The drawing number of paper is based on the desired number of samples. Let's go back to the same problem earlier. What if the researcher selects every seventh student from a random list, where the researcher tells the class to count and then selects those students who count a multiple of seven numbers? Does this situation illustrates random sampling? If you answered yes, it represents a random sampling, your answer is correct. The given situation illustrates systematic random sampling because samples are selected based on the kth consistent intervals. Selecting every seventh student on the random list of names creates an equal chance for all the students. The same thing happened in selecting students who count multiple of 7 or 7, 14, 21, and so on. So the second type of random sampling is the systematic random sampling. Systematic random sampling is a random sampling that uses a list of all the elements in the population and then elements are being selected based on the kth consistent intervals. To get the kth interval, divide the population size by the sample size. Did you experience when a store manager approaches you for a survey but did not approach other table? Maybe you're the kth customer. This is normally used by fast food stores or restaurants where they conduct survey on every 100th person who enters the store. Going back to the situation, what if the researcher separates the list of boys and girls, then draws seven names by gender? Does this situation illustrate random sampling? If your answer is yes, it represents a random sampling, your answer is correct. The given situation illustrates stratified random sampling because the students were divided into two different strata or groups, boys and girls. With a proportional number for each group, samples will then be selected at random from these two groups. So the third type of random sampling is the stratified random sampling. Stratified random sampling is a random sampling where the population is divided into different strata or divisions. The number of samples will be proportionately picked in each stratum. That is why all strata are represented in the samples. Another way of doing this is by age bracket or even by grade level or by section. Let's go back to the situation for the last time. 
What if the researcher surveys all students from three randomly selected classes out of seven classes? Does this situation illustrate random sampling? If you answered yes, it represents a random sampling, you're correct. The given situation illustrates cluster sampling since all students are divided into clusters or classes. Then three classes were selected at random out of the seven classes. All of the students of these three classes comprise the samples of the study. Take note that each cluster is mutually homogeneous, yet internally heterogeneous. So the fourth type of random sampling is the cluster sampling. Cluster sampling is a random sampling wherein population is divided into clusters or groups, and then the clusters are randomly selected. All elements of the clusters randomly selected are considered the sample of the study. The sampling techniques that involve random selection are called probability sampling. So the things that we discussed earlier, the simple random, systematic, stratified, and cluster sampling are all probability sampling techniques. But do all sampling techniques involve random selection? Exactly. There are also sampling techniques that do not involve random selection of data. They are called non-probability sampling. Do you know some of these techniques? One is convenience sampling wherein the researcher gathers data from nearby sources of information exerting minimal effort. Convenience is being used by persons giving questionnaires on the streets to ask the passers-by. Another would be purposive sampling, since the respondents are being selected based on the goal of the studies of the researcher, then it is not considered a random sampling. If the study is about the students who are children of OFWs, the researcher will only get samples who are children of OFWs. This excludes other students from being a sample. So, are you enlightened with the different techniques that we can use in the research we wish to conduct? I hope everything is clear. We know that the researchers get a clearer picture of the whole group being studied even from a sample of the population. One can draw inferences about a certain population by carefully selecting random samples and using those data to make interpretations about the entire population. Most of the researches need numerical values to easily interpret results of the study. Those values are counted based on all the elements of the population or from the randomly selected samples that were taken. The values can be classified into parameters and statistics. Parameter and statistics are usually computed through different measures of central tendency and variability. A parameter is a measure that is used to describe population, while statistic is a measure that is used to describe the sample. To understand more, let us discuss the two measures. Let us consider the grades in statistics of grade 11 students during the third quarter. 94, 85, 88, 79, 78, 75, 89, 91, 84, and 77. Let us compute the population mean, population variance, and population standard deviation. Remember, the mean is the sum of the data divided by the number of data. The mean is used to describe where the set of data tends to concentrate at a center point. The population mean is the mean computed based on the elements of the population or data. The symbol, red as mu, is used to represent population mean. To compute for the population mean, we simply add all the data and then divide it by the number of elements in the population. We can apply the given formula, where the given symbol is the population mean, the summation of x, the number of elements in the population. We can organize the data in a table. We know that n is 10. Let's use our calculator to get the summation of x. Let's add the scores, 94 plus 85 plus 88 plus 79 plus 78 
plus 75 plus 89 plus 91 plus 84 plus 77 and the answer is 840. Let's apply what we have in the formula to get the mean of the population. Let's substitute what we have. The summation of x is 840 and the number of elements in the population is 10. So we have 840 divided by 10, which is equal to 84. So our computed population mean is 84. Remember, variance and standard deviation determine how to spread or to scatter each data on the set from the mean. Standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. Population variance is the computed variance of the elements of the population. The symbol red as sigma squared is used to represent population variance. To compute for the population variance, we apply the formula where given data, the population mean number of elements in the population. While the population standard deviation is the computed standard deviation of the elements of the population, the symbol red as sigma is used to represent population standard deviation. To compute for the population standard deviation, we use the formula where is the given data, the population mean, the number of elements in the population. Consider the given data and the formula to solve for the population variance we need to get the square of the difference of the score and the mean of the sample. Let's get first the difference of the score and the mean. So it shows that 84 is subtracted from each score. So we have 94 minus 84 is 10, 85 minus 84 is 1, 88 minus 84 is 4, and so on. This time, let's get the square of the difference of the score and the mean. 10 squared is 100, 1 squared is 1, 4 squared is 16, and so on. Let's get our calculator and add the last column to get the summation of the square of the difference of the score and the mean. We have 100 plus 1 plus 16 plus 25 plus 36, plus 81, plus 25, plus 49, plus 49. And the answer is 382. Let's apply what we have in the formula to get the variance of the population. Let's substitute what we have. The summation of the square of the difference of the score and the mean is 382 and the number of elements in the population is 10. So we have 382 over 10, which is 38.2. So our computed variance is 38.2. Let's apply what we have in the formula to get the standard deviation of the population. So we key in square root followed by fraction, then we key in 382 in the numerator, arrow down, we key in 10 in the denominator, and we click on equal sign. The answer is square root of 955 over 5. We click on SD to change to decimal, and the answer is about 6.18. Another way is simply get the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. So, the population mean, population variance, and population standard deviation are what we call parameters. Remember, statistic is a measure that is used to describe the sample. From the previous data of the population, Suppose that we randomly select only 7 data out of the total 10 data in the population. The sample mean is the average of all the data of the samples. The symbol, read as x bar, is used to represent the sample mean. To compute for the sample mean, 
we simply add all the data and divide it by the number of elements in the sample. We apply the formula, where the sample mean, the summation of x, the number of elements in the sample. We can organize the data in a table. We know that n is 10. Let us use our calculator to get the summation of the student's grade in the sample. Let's add the scores. We have 94 plus 88 plus 79 plus 89 plus 91 plus 84 and plus 77. And the answer is 602. Let's apply what we have in the formula to get the mean of the sample. Let's substitute what we have. The summation of 6 is 602. The number of elements in the sample is 7. So we click in fraction. Then 602 in the numerator. Our row down. We key in 7 in the denominator. And we click on equal sign. The answer is 86. So our computed sample mean is 86. In this example, there is a slight difference between the population mean and the sample mean. But notice that there is no difference regarding the method in determining the value of the population mean and the sample mean. For the divisor, the population mean uses uppercase n, while sample mean applies lowercase n. Sample variance is the computed variance of the elements of the sample. S squared is used to represent sample variance. To compute for the sample variance, we apply the formula. Where is the given data, the sample mean, the number of elements in the sample. Sample standard deviation is the computed standard deviation of the elements of the sample. S is used to represent sample standard deviation. To compute for the sample standard deviation, we use the formula. Where is the given data? The sample mean, the number of elements in the sample. As you would notice, the sample standard deviation is also the square root of the sample variance. Consider the given data and the formula to solve for the sample variance, we need to get square of the difference of the score and the mean of the sample. Let's get first the difference of the score and the mean. Remember, the mean is 86. So it shows that 86 is subtracted from each score. So we have 94 minus 86 is 8, 88 minus 86 is 2, 79 minus 86 is negative 7, and so on. This time, let's get the square of the difference of the score and the mean. 8 squared is 64, 2 squared is 4, quantity negative 7 squared is 49, and so on. Let's get our calculator and add the values on the last column. To get the summation of the square of the difference of the score and the mean, we have 64 plus 4 plus 49 plus 9 plus 25 plus 4 plus 81 and the result is 236. Let's apply what we have in the formula to get the variance of the sample. Let's substitute what we have. The summation of the square of the difference of the score and the mean is 236, and the number of elements in the sample is 7. So we click in fraction, then 236 in the numerator. We click on arrow down. Since 7 minus 1 is 6, we click in 6 on the denominator. And the result is 118 over 3. We click on SD to change to decimal. And it's approximately 39.33. So, our computed variance is about 
point thirty three. Let's apply what we have in the formula to get the standard deviation of the sample. Let's substitute what we have. The summation of the square of the difference of the score and the mean is 236. The number of elements in the sample is 7. So, we click on the square root, followed by the fraction, and then we key in 236 in the numerator. Since 7 minus 1 is 6 in the denominator, let's key in 6. And the answer is square root of 354 over 3. We click on SD to change the decimal and the answer is approximately 6.27. So, our computed standard deviation is about 6.27. Another way is simply get the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. Let's summarize our value into table. On the next discussions, we will find the relevance knowing how to find parameters and statistics. Sample mean, sample variance, and sample standard deviation are what we call statistic. Remember that parameters are for population while statistic are for sample. Let's summarize what we have in a table. The symbol for population mean is mu with a given formula. The symbol for the variance of the population is sigma squared with a given formula. The symbol for standard deviation of the population is sigma with a given formula. The symbol for the mean is x bar with a given formula. The symbol for the variance of the sample is s squared with a given formula. And the symbol for standard deviation of the sample is s with a given formula. Since we learned about sample, this time let's learn how to construct a sampling distribution of the sample mean. What is sampling distribution? Sampling distribution of the sample mean is a frequency distribution using the computed sample mean from all the possible random samples of a particular sample size taken from the given population. In making a sampling distribution of the sample mean, we follow certain steps. First, Determine the number of sets of all possible random samples that can be drawn from the given population by using the formula of combination, where the uppercase n is the population size and the lowercase n is the sample size. Let us consider a population of senior high school consisting of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 and create a sampling distribution of size 3. To get this, we apply the formula for a combination of the population, uppercase n, taken the sample, lowercase n, at a time, where uppercase n is the size of the population and lowercase n is the sample size. Using our calculator, let's key in the fraction. Then we click on 5, shift x raised to negative 1 for the factorial. In the denominator, since it's taken 3 at a time, we click on 3, shift, x raised to negative 1 for the factorial, and since 5 minus 3 is 2, we multiply the denominator by 2, shift, x raised to negative 1 for the factorial. And the answer is 10. There is another way of doing it by using the combination in our calculator. How do we do that? Let's key in 5, shift, division sign for the combination. Since it's taken 3 at a time, we click on 3. And the answer is 10. Based on the computation, there are 10 possible random samples of size 3 without replacement. The second step in making a sampling distribution is to list all the possible random samples and solve for the sample mean of each set of samples. So the 10 possible samples are the following. And the sample mean are the following.
The third step is to construct a frequency and probability distribution table of the sample means indicating its number of occurrence or the frequency and probability. Let's list the sample means. Let's determine the frequency of the mean from the list. There is one item with a mean of 2 and 2.33 each. There are two items with a mean of 2.67, 3, and 3.33 each. And there is one item with a mean of 3.67 and 4 each. And for the last, which is the probability, the probability distribution of the sample means is also called the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Since we have 10 possible outcomes for the probability, the denominator will be 10 and the number on the numerator part will be the number of frequencies. Thus, we have the following values. And if we want to create a histogram, the sample mean will be placed on the x-axis while the probability will be placed on the y-axis as shown. It was a full-packed discussion from random sampling to discovering about parameter and statistic until the creation of sampling distribution of sample mean. Today had been a great learning experience. So, see you next week on another Math Venture with Teacher Rev. Let me leave you with a quote. Statistics can be made to prove anything, even the truth. Bye!